Hello everyone, welcome to the DH Education Podcast, your program to be updated on the digital heritage education domain. I'm your host, Raul Gomez Hernandez, and I'm glad to be here with you. In the 13th episode of the podcast, we will talk with Alexandra Strelichowska about the relevance of social media for engaging young people with cultural heritage, the elements and studies for engaging through social media, the way of supporting digital heritage education resources and activities with social media, and the recommendation to implement what we have learned from social media to get the most engaging heritage educational materials for young people. Stay to the end and discover some innovative projects and book recommendations to explore more around this topic. Social media is defined as websites and applications that enable users to create and share content and to participate in social networking. Social media in general is characterized by the use of different hypermedia elements as video, text, hyperlinks, audio, games, etc. But some of these features can be very useful for education if it's used correctly. According to Hardy Digital, for building an effective social media strategy, you need to use video, storytelling, tap into trends, encourage user-generated content, and use polls and questions and be creative. After this introduction to social media, let me propose some questions to discuss today with our speaker. How can social media be used effectively for engaging young people? What can we learn from social media for applying to digital heritage education? So, this week, I would like to talk with Alexandra Sarihoska about it. Hello, Alex. Thank you very much for coming to this podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and talk about social media. Let me introduce yourself a bit to the audience. Alexandra Sarihoska is a senior online marketing specialist at Europeana, Europe's platform for cultural heritage. She's passionate about digital and creative ways to engage people with culture. She also makes sure that the content served by cultural heritage institutions on Europeana reaches relevant audiences through various channels and social media platforms. Alexandra is an organizer of Gift It Up, an annual gift-making competition for the most creative reuse of digitized cultural heritage material and the creator of Europeana coloring books on different themes. She's an enthusiast of open glam and a firm believer that art and culture are for everyone. Along the episode of this podcast, we have been talking about different digital experiences in different media. We have recently talked about the power of VR and AR in apps or websites, the opportunities of virtual collections and virtual exhibitions, and also how video games can be really useful in the digital heritage education domain for engaging with young people. After that, finally, we must speak about the main media used by young people, the social media, that give them the opportunity to be pro-consumers of all type of content in a participatory way. What this means to be creator and consumer in real time. To understand better the significance of social media for the cultural heritage sector, could you briefly explain the opportunities offered by this media for the cultural domain and the relevance of social media for engaging people with cultural heritage? Yeah, so as the name says, uh, social media are social. So there is this element of participation which is already included in the way they work. And uh, people use them to interact with their friends, with their family, with their favorite brands. But this means that for cultural heritage institutions or educators in cultural heritage, there is a chance to have their content and whatever they have to share within the feed. So between images from or uh, messages and posts from the family, from their favorite brands, from the events, from the artists and kind of pop culture things they follow. It's also um, something that people know how to use and how to um, access. So there is no problem that they need to know a specific website address or they have to like go to a specific new place uh, to discover the content. They can explore the content in the place where they already are, which uh, makes it easier, makes it quicker and kind of gives an idea and uh, possibility to all the time uh, be in touch with um, those audiences. So there is not only one moment where you really need to bring someone to a specific website or a place, but you actually can reach them at every moment whenever they are. That's true. 
Social media is a powerful way of connecting with people, because this media is ubiquitous in the way it could be available everywhere you go, and you can connect with any device and socialize at any moment with anyone. It's also that, you know, you carry all your social apps on your smartphone, which means you don't have to be in a specific location to do it. You don't need to be on a desktop. And the way the social media are designed is that um, everything will look good and it will be easy to just use it and access on your phone, uh, on your tablet, it can be also on a desktop, but you don't need a specific environment to engage with culture. You can have like three minutes before your train arrives or you can have a little break in your school day or you are just... Uh, browsing in the evening and at every of these moments you can interact with the cultural heritage content and this is something which is quite powerful because in this way culture becomes a part of everyone's daily life. What you say is exactly what the term ubiquitous means and it's definitely what I think. Many researchers reported in the last few years that social media is the best way to connect with young people. Some cultural institutions around the world have created a lot of content for their social media accounts during the COVID-19 pandemic, making some of this content viral. To become viral doesn't mean to have a loyal audience ready for you, as loyalty with your project or your institution is a process that grows little by little along the time. Taking this situation, could you explain which elements and stages in your experience are the most effective for engaging and connecting with your audience through social media along the time? First of all, going viral is cool and it's fun and it gives, of course, a lot of exposure within like a very short time. But this is not something that on the long term will um, engage audiences. What happens while uh, engaging audiences, it's as you said, little steps um, over a longer period of time and to achieve that, you need consistency. So if you decide, I want to have um, engaged social media audiences, you decide whether you are able with the content and resources you have to post weekly or monthly or every day. And then once you decide to do it, you have to stick to it. It's uh, important that your feed uh, as much as possible organically is visible uh, to your audiences. It means um, it has to be interesting, it has to be unique, which means really special and uh, for what your institution is about or your educational program or um, whatever you, you want to show. And it's also important that it's actual. So following the trend, sometimes there are like uh, memes that are being created by everyone. It's good to take part in that, to kind of show that you are a part of a bigger picture and of like active reality. But at the same time, uh, be proud of your content and of its uniqueness and try to be consistent in the way you draw the audiences, you communicate it. So if you, for example, have a weekly post, um, you can make it as a series so people will expect something to happen. If you have daily stories, um, check how much they are shared. Um, and in this way, you create growth, which is uh, more sustainable rather than having a spike and then kind of losing access to your own audiences. I think many elements that you highlighted are really important and really applicable in the way the digital education resources can be used. For example, what you say about the content on social media, that this would be interesting, actual, as they follow the trends, or new, as they can be different and attractive for the audience, I think many application resources does, as they try to feel the people motivated and interested in their content, and they do something new, actual and unique to be attractive following the trend and the most modern technologies in every moment. And that could be the way to go. Yeah, true. And uh, this is, uh, I guess, both applicable f for funny things and like a little bit of a playful content, like probably uh, a lot of different institutions with uh, diverse content could make like a Dolly Parton meme, which is a very funny thing. And it's just kind of... Uh, 
moment of fun, but at the same time, um, there are issues in the world, uh, women's history, inclusivity and diversity, which are also connected to different and diverse types of content. It's not only about art, it's on, not only about history in kind of pure understanding, but uh, searching for a relation between important topics from now and different types of content from very different areas. It's uh, something powerful. And it also shows how cultural heritage can explain a lot of things and put into perspective. And while this is done for social media, it's of course easier to access for the audiences and it's, uh, it uh, becomes more accessible and a lower threshold than when you have like a academic publication or you need people to go somewhere to uh, read it or learn it. In the heritage education domain, some museums have used social media's participatory practice to get feedback from their activities, to inform the audience about content available and events, and also to get the audience continuously involved in their practices. Taking these examples in a digital way and also as we are immersed in a moment where distance education is the model preferred in the sector because many museums are not still open, we'll just explain how social media can support digital heritage education resources and activities in the actual moment. So uh, first of all, I would say before you start any activities, think about um, young people's safety while online and uh, about well their well-being because Social media has a lot of advantages, they are very powerful, but it's also, as we know, there are mental health problems coming out, actually, the social media use. So uh, for every activity you organize as an educator, I would uh, recommend to make sure that the environment you would be working in is safe and is collaborative. But once this is arranged, there are uh, plenty of possibilities. So from more uh, big picture institutional point of view, it might be fun to have, for example, uh, students or pupils take over social media accounts of uh, institutions or a school and just kind of show the world how they see things. Another thing is that through different projects and activities. Uh, it's possible to connect uh, with uh, other students and children in different parts of the world and do something together and showcase in uh, a fun way. So of course it's possible to run an account, but they also can kind of post and uh, use a shared hashtag and uh, work on projects together. If you think about um, making videos, it's um, quite easy and uh, you can train the presentation skills and uh, kind of showcasing the material. And there are different platforms from like YouTube, which is typically invented for it to uh, more playful like reels or stories where you show it a little bit differently, but uh, it's still a lot of fun. Um, another option is um, to give uh, pupils and children a way to um, give their opinion through social media. So it could be different things when they vote for their favorite things, or they choose, or they nominate, and um, like this they can kind of express what they like, what they find interesting, and this can be followed somewhere else uh, during their educational process and last but not at least uh, quite a bit of social media platforms have uh, this kind of interactive component with quizzes co-creations questions and this can be used for both delivering but also playfully testing the knowledge thank you very much for those recommendations they will help our audience to make better use of them in their domains and some of them are really important for all. For example, as you mentioned, there are health problems from social media and for this reason it's important to develop a safe environment for all young people who are using or involved in their activities. The co-creation way you mentioned is a good way of creating the safe environment as they can share their opinions on what they feel in every moment.
Also, the museum can know what the participants are interested in each moment. Educational platforms work in the same way. Well, we have talked about the relevance of social media for engaging young people with cultural heritage, the elements and strategies for engaging through social media, and the ways of supporting the digital heritage educational resources and activities with social media. To end this talk, I would like to talk with you about how these elements you mentioned before can be applied in a practical way. So, could you tell the listeners which are your recommendations for applying these elements and stages you highlighted into the development process of heritage education resources for young people? So, first of all, uh, you need to be up to date with how different platforms work, what is available and uh, what changes. And I tell you, uh, it changes very fast and very often and the platforms, of course, compete with each other so you have changes in algorithms in functionalities and this is something that you really need to be aware of because the way you work with the content and work with people is uh, very much dependent on that once you have this a little bit covered you, you can do it through like following uh, online publications on that um, just uh, attending webinars or just uh, reading about it, learning from uh, your peers. Once this is covered, it's uh, important to do your own testing because every audience is different. They will uh, differ in size, they will differ in age, they will differ in the way they interact with the content. And also, if you have something over a longer uh, period of time, you will have a part of the audience growing while another one is new and you have to accommodate that and testing uh, different approaches uh, really helps here. Uh, this means you have to be ready to fail sometimes and admit it. And uh, how to know how to test. Uh, you should uh, know your metrics. So of course we have followers, we have likes, but it's important to be able to look beyond it. So on some platforms, for example, Instagram, saves are actually as important, if not more than the likes, because then it means someone will have your content somewhere on their device to access later, maybe multiple times. Similarly, uh, more and more uh, platforms will have this uh, direct message box. So I would recommend treating that seriously. And if someone is asking a question, giving you a compliment or giving you a critique, take it seriously and take time and use your resources to actually have this conversation. It might seem like, oh, I only chat with one person but all the thousands of followers you have are actually people and each of them is different. And if they want to talk with you, you should um, really appreciate this chance and have this dialogue. Another thing, uh, what is important is an engagement rate rather than uh, the absolute numbers of followers. So there is a moment that um, when you have really a lot of followers, the number uh, of the ones that you actually reach is smaller and smaller. And whether you actually uh, try to reach your own followers or the new ones, it's in the end kind of the same. So I wouldn't worry about how many new followers uh, you get. I would... Uh, Try to keep it sustainable, slow, but make sure that the ones that you have, that you give them the most ex the best experience possible and that they, uh, they remain engaged and they in remain enjoying your content. This is a kind of a way to achieve success in this. And last thing, there are plenty of tools uh, online which help uh, research hashtags, uh, track a bit uh, the most popular trends, um, plan and schedule your social media activity. So this is something to explore and as much as possible kind of be aware of uh, the hashtags you use, uh, plan your content when possible, but also 
kind of be ready that there might be a moment that you need to switch everything up because of um, an external event in the world or just create something quickly because uh, there is an opportunity to use um, that would uh, bring uh, attention and interest to your content. So this is something that comes with experience and you also need a bit of guts and uh, having this uh, type of guts that uh, lets you create something and release it quickly um, over time it should also pay back. Thank you for the recommendation again. All these tips are superb. To control your numbers it's really important for measuring what your impact is, how the engagement process goes. In educational resources works in the same way. You need to test what works and how it works but align it with your learning outcomes and get a positive social impact back. For many managers, numbers are really important, and they definitely are, but you need to know how to read them. Yeah, in general, it's kind of a work that never stops, if you think about that, because the platforms change, the audiences and the way they interact with the platforms change. The, probably the content you have to offer also change, because for some museums, new stuff are getting is getting digitized, or there are things of a better quality or they have new physical activities that can be promoted uh, in some way or they wanted to have a physical activity which cannot happen because we are in the pandemic. So it's something that it's uh, very dynamic and you need to keep up. But I think, as especially in the last year, uh, there is more understanding and more maybe respect towards the social channels are as actually a way of sharing the knowledge, information and engaging people and that it's not a side activity but it's like a full-blown serious activity which can reach audiences but also reach audiences way beyond uh, audiences that a museum would normally uh, be able to uh, encourage to interact with the content. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity to talk with you and so how much social media and digital heritage education resources have in common. Thank you very much, it's been a pleasure and to everyone listening, good luck with your social media activities. If you would like to learn more about engaging your audience through social media, I recommend you to read the practical guide edited by Heritage Digital titled A Guide to Growing and Engaging Audiences Online in August 2020. To learn about the benefits of social media for heritage education in museums, I suggest you to read the paper written by Angelina Russo, Jerry Watkins and Susan Grotwater smith titled the impact of social media on informal learning in museums, published in the 46th number of the Educational Media International Journal, Volume 2, in 2009. If you want to know European projects working on how social media studies are developed in museums, I recommend you visit the website of the project, The Digital Future of Cultural Heritage and Education, a Social Media Research Agenda for the Scottish National Collections. This project from the University of Edinburgh aims to become the established a research agenda for museums and gallery education for the digital age and to inform policy and practice in the use of social media and user-generated content by the Scottish cultural heritage sector. Another interesting project is the MUSA project. The aim of the Museum Sector Alliance project, MUSA, is to address the increasing disconnection between formal education and training and the wall of work because of the emergence of new job roles due to the quickening pace of deduction of ICT in the museum sector. This project has a lot of interesting outputs, like a MOOC for improving your skills and achieving the new level in your career. Thank you very much for being here today with Alexandra Tsulhovska and me in this podcast. This is the last episode of interviews with academic, researchers and professionals around the topic. I would like to thank all people who have participated in these interviews and people who can do it, but they have been a support for the project and all listeners who have been with us during all these weeks. Next week, five case studies and analyzed using the four dimensions of digital heritage education resources will be explained together. Find all the resources from the topic we talk about in this podcast on the resources section of the digital education blog. 
If you like this podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel, share with your colleagues, follow the podcast on Spotify, iBox, or any platform you listen to, and follow the parades on social media. See you next week.